I want to call the East Greenbush Central School District Board of Education meeting for October 20th to order. Uh, present tonight, all members present. Mr. Dunn is not here and Ms. Skamersky or Ms. Muth. Um, we do expect Ms. Skamersky shortly. With that, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. So I guess we have uh, some guests tonight. So Mr. Simons. Uh, yeah, so I want to thank Mrs. Badger, Shelly Badger from Columbia High School for bringing members of her choral group here this evening to celebrate and honor School Board Recognition Week. And we have uh, an initial performance and then we'll have a performance later on in the meeting. Uh, we want our Board of Education and our community to recognize the importance of Boards of Education our particular Board of Education, as you can see from the treats that we provided you, is not your average board. So without further ado, Mrs. Badger and her choral group, Columbia High School. So great way to start the meeting. Thank you very much. Um, so now we turn it over to our student council. So Ryan and Emma. Good, e good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, for October, we have engaged, been engaged in a number of events in support of breast cancer charities and awareness. As you all saw when you walked in, we decorated the lobby at the beginning of the month. Um, and today we hosted the first annual breast cancer awareness tie-dye event in the CHS courtyard and made pink shirts for the pink out on Friday. Tomorrow, today, and Friday, we are selling pink packs full of items for students to wear on Friday. The proceeds for these events will be donated. This week, we are having blood drive signups outside of the cafeteria during all lunch periods. We will be hosting the blood drive next Tuesday, October 26th. Students 16 and 17 years old can participate in, with parent permission, and those 18 or older are eligible to donate. Those who donate will receive a $5 online gift card and some Red Cross merchandise. Uh, and as we wrap up October, we will be uh, gearing up for the holiday season. So we have a couple events planned for that. Thank you. That's all we have for tonight. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Emma. Is it still going? Okay. So uh, we'll go on to the uh, next item is the draft minutes. Um, for September 29th, any revisions or corrections of the draft minutes? All board members were present. Seeing no changes, any motion to approve those minutes? Mark, second, Kathleen, all those in favor? Approved. So for the minutes for 10-6, I was not present. Kathleen or Joanne, does that give us a, enough to, one, two, three, four, no. So we will uh, hold off on those and move those to the next meeting. 
Okay, so we can approve those uh, when uh, we have a quorum. So with that, we will move to our board forum. Um, starting on my left, Michelle, anything? Okay. Mark, good. Kathleen, Joanne, no. Frank and Cheryl, nothing. So just one comment. Uh, I don't know if you're gonna talk about Mr. Simons, but uh, I was able to attend the uh, Green Meadow uh, School of National School of Excellence uh, event, and I see a few folks that were here. Mr. Gare, great job with the staff and the folks for, for putting that on. It was a wonderful celebration. I was very proud to part be able to participate um, as a board member and as a parent of Green Meadow children, and also as a former attendee of Green Meadow. So it was a great, uh, great event. I, I appreciate it. So, with that, we'll move to our public forum. Residents, students, employees, and business representatives of the East Greenwood Central School District may address the board on matters concerning programs and or operations of the district other than matters involving personnel. Members of the board do not directly respond to citizen concerns during the public forum. If a response is appropriate, either the president or superintendent will contact the individual in the near future. Those persons wishing to address the board will be recognized by the chair of the meeting and should state for the record their name and address or affiliation with the district or business. While the board does not wish to infringe upon free speech protections, it must be stressed that the visitor's forum is not deemed to be an open forum. The board president will conduct the forum for the orderly efficient operation of board business. In addition, any remarks which may be considered defamatory or stigmatizing or prohibited to be declared out of order. All comments shall be limited to five minutes. Is there anyone who would like to address the board? Yes, sir. Hey, my name is David Jones. I am a resident of the district, have been so for 35 years. Um, I have two questions for the board. Um, the first one is um, I've heard some neighboring districts have recently hired a new type of administrator. And I was wondering if our school district has hired this kind of administrator. Um, the title, or does, does the administrator have a, a title similar to this, Director of Equity, Inclusi Inclusivity, and Diversity? Have we done anything like that recently, or do we plan to do anything like that? Oh, you can't ask me now. OK, that's right. OK, uh, if so, I'd like to know um, why and who's paying for this position. OK, secondly, has our school district implemented a course of study centering around critical race theory or is it in the process uh, or in the planning stages? Those are my two questions. And if I understand correctly, at the next board meeting, you would provide an answer to those questions. Well, we can uh, provide a response to uh, a couple of those questions now, probably, Mr. Simons, right? Okay, so we'll be glad to answer those questions. Um, Mr. Simons? Yes, thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, two good questions. We, um, we have not hired a separate administrator to oversee programs or uh, initiatives related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we did form a committee uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, which I oversee as the superintendent. There are other administrators and teachers and staff and um, support staff on that committee. And our focus has been on uh, making sure that we have uh, an inclusive school culture, that we are as inviting and welcoming and supportive as we can be by looking at our policies, uh, by looking at the way that we implement the uh, teaching and learning strategies in the classroom, by making sure that we have uh, people identified in each of the schools to welcome people who may move into the uh, community from outside of our region or even outside of our country. Um, and uh, that's the way we've approached it. And we've provided a lot of professional development through Mr. McHugh's office to make sure that our staff is trained uh, to uh, implement as uh, inclusive practices, uh, both in the classroom, uh, in our extracurricular activities, and in the way that we interact with our children and our families. We are not adopting a course of study uh, regarding cultural, uh, excuse me, critical race theory. It is not something that we have discussed. Uh, it is uh, not uh, part of the New York State Education Department standards, and so we are not approaching that uh, in any any manner. Very good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Anyone else like to address the public, or address the board? I should say, from the public. All right. We'll close the public forum and move to reports and presentations of the superintendent. Yes, I want to re-invite Mrs. Badger 
and the members of our high school chorus to uh, rejoin us. Uh, this is uh, School Boards Recognition Week, and uh, we want to take the opportunity at this board meeting not only to celebrate the leadership of our board, but to recognize the time commitment, the amount of focus, uh, energy, and community spirit that is required to be a Board of Education member. We also recognize that participating in the board is an enormous responsibility under typical circumstances, but even more so during the last year and a half as our schools have been challenged to remain offering high quality learning, high quality teaching, and student support to our students during a global pandemic. I appreciate working for a Board of Education that has the general welfare of the students at the forefront of its decision making and its planning, and I appreciate the diverse interests of our board, but that we come together and we find ways to work together to support the community through celebrating our students and supporting what we can do to keep our children successful. As evidence of the success of our children and the support of the board, uh, we bring our music programs forward tonight uh, as part of this celebration. Mrs. Badger. since you went students. I wondered if we could modify the agenda and have about 10 more songs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. Well, I want to thank um, the chorus, Ms. Badger, and uh, my colleagues and the community for supporting us as board members um, in the district. The uh, the tokens are much appreciated. The you know to me the to be able to participate to to in events like that, kind of the highlights. You know, being part of our school district, um, being able to see the children, see the students, the accomplishments. Uh, it's the reward that we do um, for what we do here at the, in the board and, and volunteer our time because it's important to us, it's important to our community. And to, again, my reward is just to be able to give back and to, to see the accomplishments of our students and, and the great things that are happening in the district. So uh, thank you once again. We appreciate the honor of serving the community and the school community and being on the Board of Education. Anyone else uh, comments? All right, seeing none, no? Okay, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Simons for uh, the next item. Yes, this is the time of year that we uh, present the annual audit for the prior school year. Uh, Ms. Wagger is going to uh, introduce our uh, representative from Bonadale to talk about the, uh, the audit of last school year, uh, which was a strong audit. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Wagger. Thank you, Mr. Simons. That was a really hard act to follow, I might add. The <laughs> whole agenda is a hard act to follow. Right? <laughs> uh, but thank you. Uh, so this evening in your packets for your review um, are the financial statements for the district, as well as the extra classroom financial statements and the required communications letter from the auditor. The um, Bonadio and Company has been our auditors for some time. We entered into a five-year engagement with them for the first year ending 630-16 uh, through 630-20. The board approved a one-year extension on May 26th. And in December 2021, we will issue an RFP for audit services for the next five-year uh, cycle. So included, um, I'll start with the required communications letter. This is a standard letter that we see each year. One of the things I do want to point out is that under the significant uh, significant audit findings and accounting estimates. It is noted that the district implemented GASB 84 this year. That has to do with fiduciary activities and how we account for them. There's more information on note, in note 15 on that uh, accounting principle change. So on to the financial statements for the district. That is the larger booklet that you have. The most important part of this is that the district received an unmodified opinion, which can be found on page two. And it states that the financial statements pre prevent, present fairly in all material respects, the respective financial position of the governmental activities, each major fund and the aggregate remaining fund information of the East Greenbush Central School District as of June 30th, 2021. That is considered an unmodified opinion and that is the auditor's highest level of assurance. This is important to us as we look to um, issue debt in the future. It helps our bond ratings and our financial condition. Also included in the large packet is the management discussion and analysis. analysis. That can be found on pages four through 13. And this just provides a, an overview of the financial operations and the changes that have taken place from this year from prior year and uh, some of the explanations for that. And that's meant to be in an easy to read format. One of the things that I do want to note is that uh, this year, the district um, was slightly over the 4% maximum level for unappropriated fund balance that were allowed by New York State. We are at 5.06%, so we're slightly a million dollars over um, the 4% level. Uh, I will talk to the board about some ideas that I have uh, going forward with that. One of the things that I would like to consider in the future and when we prepare our budget uh, in May, we may want to uh, consider establishing a capital reserve. This is some, a reserve that will need to be approved by the voters of the district. And then each year, the, the board can 
approve funding for that. And that funding um, then has to be approved, the expense of it has to be approved by voters again. And this will help to um, eliminate some of the debt that we may need to issue for capital projects. And also that will save on interest expense. Uh, also, um, I wanted to remind everyone that we have a large emergency project uh, taking place over the Transportation Center. The bids have gone out on that and they've been received and approved and we expect to start work in about a month. We're working with the DEC on that. We will have to uh, pay some of these expenses this year and probably into next year and we will receive the aid. It, although it's an emergency project, we'll receive the aid all at once in one year. We're probably not going to get that aid until possibly 23-24 when we file the final cost report. And then one final thing I would like to remind everyone of is, although we have um, some excess fund balance this year, we we looked at our fund balance, we looked at projections, and we decided to go out with a 0% tax levy increase as a result of that. Uh, moving on in the financial statements, uh, there is the statement of net position, the statement of activities, those are in compliance with GASB 34, they're on a full accrual basis of accounting. And uh, we also have an appropriated fund balance of 6829000 $322. That is included as part of our budget, and that money is used to reduce the tax levy each year. One thing I do want to point out to you on this on page 18, our food service operation ended the year with a negative fund balance of 454000 and that was partially due to an operating loss this year of 200, approximately 284000 we are looking at that. We do expect some improvement in this coming year. Our federal reimbursement rates have increased. However, last year we only had half the students in at a time. So now we have all of the students in. So we're expecting to recover a bit of that. The notes to the financial statements start on page 21 and go through page 50. So they're, they're quite involved and uh, they're, they're quite expansive. You will find a lot of information on our pension plan reporting, on our post-employment benefits other than pensions, and now there's um, additional information on the change in accounting principle as we adopted GASB 84. There is some supplementary information on pages 51 to 58, which is very interesting to look at. You'll look at um, revenues and expenditures and how they compare to budget. And and then we uh, show how our adopted budget has changed. So we show the adopted budget and then how, how it has increased. It increases by the proposition for bus purchases. It increases by gifts uh, and donations, Pepsi money, and E-rate. We also, uh, because we receive over $2 million in federal money, we are required to have a single audit our auditors this year chose to audit the CARES Act money, which was about $350,000, you'll recall from last year, as well as the nutrition program. Uh, that's it for the, that's, that's what I have to say about the financial statements for the district. The uh, smaller packet is the extra classroom activity fund statement. That is a cash basis statement of the activity of the financial clubs at the high school and the middle school. That too has also um, received an unmodified opinion, which is, which is a, a real accomplishment um, because uh, this is an area where there is uh, always a lot of concern by the auditors and to receive an unmodified opinion is um, very good for our district. I would like to thank Karen Bauer, who was our extra classroom treasurer for the 2021 year. And I would especially like to thank Mary Ridzi, who is here with us this evening. She is our district treasurer and supervising accountant. So this was her first year of audit, and um, we really appreciate all of your hard work and the work of the business office staff. And uh, also here this evening is Kyleen Fitzik, who is the audit manager for Bonadio and Company. So I'm going to ask her to come up and um, 
add any comments, and then if you have any questions, we can go over those. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Kyleen Fitzek, and I'm an external auditor with the Bonadio Group and was the audit manager um, on your school district audit engagement. We recently completed the audit and went through the reports in detail with your audit committee. I'm here tonight just to go over a summarized version at a high level of the audit results and answer any questions that any of you may have. First, I'd like to thank Linda, Mary, and uh, their, the business office for all of their assistance during, during the audit. They were very well prepared and very responsive to um, all the requests and questions that we had for them. As Linda mentioned, there are three deliverables that we provided to the board. The first is your financial statements. The second is your audit of the extra classroom funds. And then the third is the required communications letter. So first, the, uh, the school district's annual audit of the financial statements includes the independent auditor's um, opinion on the financial statements. We have issued an unmodified opinion on those financial statements. Um, an unmodified opinion is the highest level of assurance that we as auditors can provide the school district. The other report that is included in your basic financial statements is the governmental auditing standards report. This report requires us to gain an understanding and report on your internal controls over financial reporting. We're pleased to note that there were no material weaknesses and no significant deficiencies to be made aware of. The second part of that report is your compliance with laws, regulations, and grant contracts. That non-compliance could lead to a material financial statement impact. There is one compliance finding to report, which Linda noted, um, and that's you're limited to retaining 4% of the school budget in unreserved, unappropriated fund balance, and you are over that limit at 5.06%. Then there is the independent auditor's report on compliance with the requirements to each major program and on the internal controls over financial reporting um, in compliance with the uniform guidance. In simple terms, that's the audit on the federal awards, the school district's federal dollars. We have issued an unmodified opinion on that report. Again, the highest level of assurance that we as auditors can provide you. And then we did not identify any material weaknesses and no significant deficiencies on the federal awards, those federal dollars, the internal controls over the major programs that we had tested. And lastly, we issued the school district's annual audit of the extra classroom financial statements. And we are issuing and have issued a modified opinion on those reports. And as Linda mentioned, you should be very proud that, that that's always a concern and area of risk that we as auditors look at and that's it's great to receive that opinion on those financial statements so that's a very high level review of your audit reports um, again thank you to linda and to mary in the business office it's a pleasure to work with them as always um, and i'm open to any questions that any of you may have board members any questions any members from the audit committee who had any questions at all and no good thumbs up all right i think we're all set great great to hear thank, thank you. you thank you Good news. All right, that, that concludes our audit report uh, presentation. Mr. Simons? Uh, yes. Uh, you may recall that in the spring of last year and through the beginning of the summer, the administration and the board had discussions about programs that we might want to fund through the uh, federal monies that we were receiving. And one of the areas that we focused on was student engagement. As kids were coming back to school in person, we not only look at student engagement from a standpoint of instruction in the classroom, but were there some after school activities that we might be able to offer students that could expand the number of kids that might be involved in, um, in after school programs. I had recalled that a couple of years ago, uh, two teachers from Columbia High School had come to talk to me about the idea of clay targeting teams, and um, they are here tonight to present uh, their program. Uh, Pete Zilgme and Laura Gedney. I think Pete's here. I don't know if Laura is here. Laura is here. There she is. I didn't recognize her with the mask. 
And I will share with you that when they first introduced this to me, they said, why don't you come down to the Nassau Sports Club <laughs> and try it? And I did. And after five or six tries, Pete showed me how to hit the, tar hit the clay target, and I did. So, And I haven't been back since, but I will come back to see the kids in action. So. Um, so my name is Laura Gedney. I teach English here at the high school. I'm Pete Zogme and a former teacher now being retired. <laughs> so we d both discovered that we both share this passion for um, Clay Target and we had approached Mr. Simons with this um, a while back and we were really pleased that he as well as um, the board and administration was on board with it. So we're just going to do a brief overview of exactly what it is and kind of how this will involve our Columbia High School students. Thank you. Um, so first thing we want to talk about in general is um, what is Clay Target? Um, what exactly it is? So. Um, if you look at the the board over here uh, this is what the playing field essentially looks like so there are five different stations and one person will be at each station and that little sorry the uh, little uh, square in the middle that's called the trap house and these clay ceramic discs will be thrown out from that and each person on the five line will take turns um, hitting these clay targets as they're flying through the air. Unless anyone has a question about it, I think it's, you shoot, it, a round is 25 times now. Yes. So you shoot five at each position and kind of constantly move. Yeah. So the guys yeah. Are, yeah. Yeah. What we call it is behind the shooters. Yes. So he's also <laughs> our range uh, safety officer. So, um, you know, he's, he's the one directing after everybody's taken their shots, um, everyone moves along the line. So everyone will get a chance to shoot five times at each station. I, I think the one thing that we always, when we brought this forward, I mean, as soon as you hear guns and shooting, there's right away, a, you know, that statement. It's very, very organized. It's very, very strict. There's no oops in what this is. So that person, whoever it is, it, it, there's no questioning there. They tell you to do something, you do it. If, if there's a misfire, you know, if something doesn't work, you don't, you know, there's a procedure. There's everything is organized. So you don't, they'll yell, well, they'll speak very sternly to you, uh, no matter who you are, about how you handle things. And uh, so that's just kind of, you know, we just want to make sure that's one of the underlying things, this whole safety issue, obviously. Yeah, I think one of the cool things about this as well is this is really like a lifelong sport. Um, you can get into it when you're 10 years old and you can shoot until you're, you know, 85 years old. Sorry. Um, so we were really excited to, to offer this to our Columbia students. Um, so talking a little bit about um, what our season will look like. So student athletes will participate in an eight week season and this is offered to them in the springtime. So the first two weeks are typically uh, practice weeks. So we're looking to practice two times a week at the Nassau Sportsman's Club. Um, and then we'll have five weeks of actual competition. Um, so the competition is virtual. So our Columbia students will go to the Sportsman's Club. We will have our uh, time to, to uh, participate in the competition. And then scores are loaded on a USA Clay Target website and that compiles all of New York State uh, high school teams, their points together, and then um, that's how they rank uh, each, each participating high school. So I talked briefly about this earlier, but um, why is this a good program for our students? Um, <coughs> one of the things that I really enjoy about it is it's a lifelong sport, so you can do this no matter how old you are. Um, you can be short, tall, you can, um, have some physical disabilities, um, and it doesn't really matter. It seems like everybody really gets an equal opportunity to, to participate in this. And so I think that's a really cool thing to offer our high school students, um, the students that aren't um, typically seen as, you know, typically athletic, um, they, they would have no problem uh, participating in this. And so I think that's kind of a cool thing and it's so inclusive to all of our students. So we, when uh, when we were looking into this organizing, we obviously need a place to shoot. 
So we, uh, Nassau Sportsman's Club is very big. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. It's a couple hundred, Mark, you know, it's probably three, 400 people, I assume. Um, yeah, if no more. And so, and they're very active. Uh, they have youth uh, rifle, they have youth, you know, so they were obviously the people we went to. And one of the things that we want to make sure is there's a, you know, ratio and some of them already have tr been trained. They're, um, they're uh, instructors in pistol, rifle, shotgun. We've also talked about a safety course they have to take. They have already have officers that do that, that teach those courses. So obviously when we were looking at it, we want to make sure everything's kind of like we, whatever they want, you know, and we want to work together. We have to make sure they understand we have children to work with and they're full on board, 100%. It's been kind of enjoyable. Um, probably have too many people who want, to, want to be involved with us, so we'll have to make sure we, we follow all the rules with that. They have range officers that already are registered and taught, you know, their safety range officers. We will be taking courses in this as well, even though we're certified or certified teachers. Obviously, it's a little bit different. Um, we've asked, we pretty much have, each child will take either the league offers a, a course, but we're also looking at the New York State uh, Hunter Safety course, which pretty much is a standard bear. You know, there's no question that he's focused on safety, which is, the, again, what we're talking about. Um, every child will be required hearing and eye protection. That's, that's standard. No one goes up there without those things pretty much now. Um, and... You know, and like we said, we also have talked to them already about um, having a safe there. Uh, kids will not be bringing their guns to school. All right, that's not allowed. Uh, but they will have a place, a safe place there. We've talked about that, uh, and they're more than willing to, to find a place and, you know, help us organize that. So all of that is in, in the works for us. And, you know, we already had, Laura already had a meeting with some students. Uh, so we know there's an interest. Um, and then we just have to kind of like slowly piece it all together. And we'll use other schools already that have done this to have some guidance with that. Um, yeah, during the pandemic, we, you know, it, you can't stand next to the person when you shoot. So it's, it's definitely one of the best sports that way. There's no, there's no uh, contact. We, we'll make sure of that. Uh, so it, it works. The only thing that we do after, obviously, is the guns would have to be. Uh, cleaned off and so on, but otherwise it's not really an issue, I don't think. Hopefully not. Um, this is, we, the timetable for us is, um, we know that the season starts at a certain point. So trying to get your approval kind of sets us in motion uh, because we have to go to the league, you know, the, the New York State League and so on and so forth and kind of get everything rolling. And then we already looked at the, you know, we talked with assignments about trying to see what the interest is and you know we have to kind of make sure that we have enough time and one of the things we'll be coordinating with the nasa uh, sportsman's club about when do they want to run the courses when do they you know when they're available because we're going to be asking them to do us some favors and you know but it's i think it's a little bit different and then you know sports is sports it's a different type of sport and there's a lot of people at that sportsman's club that are members of this community and they were really excited about this whole thing, um, probably more so than we expected. You know, <laughs> you know, so it was pretty, hopefully keep moving forward. Um, we will have some concerns, I think, it might as well be on, you know, getting shells right now, ammunition, sh the shortages of certain things. And we're not sure yet. And we're putting feelers out to other teams. What are they doing? You know, you're trying to find out if, you know, if a large club has access to things. So that's kind of, we're, we're going to have to feel our way through certain things like that. I don't know if we have, um, yeah, we, Mr. Simons had indicated that we want to keep the cost to bare minimum uh, for the, our students, you know, because it is, you know, we don't know what we're dealing with necessarily. Some kids might have a, a very expensive gun and some kids might not have any guns. So, um, and trying to figure all that out will obviously be a big part of this. The we've also talked to the uh, sportsmen's club, and there they were offering the idea of the clay pigeons. They take the cost; they would soak up the cost of that for us. Which those are those ceramic discs. Yeah, that's a clay pigeon. So um, you know, and 
this, you know, so there's certain things that we'll have to figure out from a budgetary type of aspect, what we're looking at and whether or not, you know, the guns are available to purchase guns. You know, it obviously is a one-time purchase. You don't get to take it home with them at the end of this. Um, so it'd be something to consider, obviously. Um, and I was very pleased that the Sportsman's Club has offered a space for us to safely store the firearms as well as the ammunition. Um, you know, that, that keeps a very large separation, obviously, between school and uh, the Sportsman's Club. The, the, it, you know, one of the things we're going to make clear to the students is there'll be deadlines because the fact that your course is going to have to be held. And we want all the kids taking the course with us, not like, well, I already have this. Well, that's not going to fly. Um, and obviously, we might end up hurting someone's feelings because of the timetable. But, you know, again, there's a lot of things to consider with this. Um, we also go and we will have to take a look at NASA's uh, support. You know, we don't want 15 coaches there. You know, we're just going to have to figure out how we're going to do it. We'll use the, the board's, um, you know, the idea of a volunteer, how to go about uh, becoming a volunteer coach and that sort of thing. Um, we're allowed 10, pre, 10 people. 10 students per coach. So we're looking at possibly having another faculty member joining us and doing this. And we're trying to figure that out, seeing who's interested in it. So a couple of names have popped up. So I, I did hold an interest meeting for students last week um, here at the high school. And I got, I believe it was 18 students showed up um, just to learn more about this opportunity. So I'm thinking that, you know, we might add a little bit more. Some might drop out, but I'm thinking we'll probably, I'm hoping have around um, 20 students that want to participate. One of the things is the cost, there's obviously very minimal cost of going transportation because we'll always be shooting at the NASA club. We don't have to travel unless they make the states at the end, then that's a bit of a different use. We're not there yet. Yeah. So, so we, I think we got, do we have more? Oh, we have more. Um, yeah. So um, we already have, uh, I've sent our forms in to be registered through the New York State Play Target League. And so I am waiting on um, them to get back to me with paperwork so we can move forward. Um, but really, the next step would be the, sorry, the procurement of uh, materials for students um, because that is that list is rather lengthy. Um, safety equipment, firearms, safe, um, and ammunition as well. So, um, but we're we're working our way there. Um, and just some additional information. This is just, um, you know, uh, additional info, but um, there are a lot of high schools around us that are joining the New York State Clay Target League as well. I know um, Galway, um, Burnt Hills. So a lot of local districts are getting into this, and I really think it's a great opportunity for students or scholarship opportunity. Um, I think it's just a really inclusive sport, and um, I'm really excited to offer it to Columbia High School students. It is interesting when I dark ages went to high school when i went to high school we had a rifle team and a lot of schools had rifle teams and it, you know things have changed obviously uh but it, it's something that when it came about it, we didn't realize it was this big in new york state especially out in western new york state mm. uh so in galway uh actually has a young boy who's got cerebral palsy that shoots he's in a wheelchair i think he's yeah, uh, yeah. yeah so Got you with that one, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions? Uh, so, assuming if they sign up, this will be free for all That's correct. Right. I, well, um, one of the things that um, we wanted to offer students, like for example, I had a, a student come to me and ask me, you know, well, I'm doing track. Can I still participate in this, this sport? Since we are going to have a one day for practice and one day for competition shooting, we're hoping that that doesn't necessarily limit students to just taking one sport or participating in one sport. So maybe they can do this in addition to something else as well. Anybody else? All right. Well, I re really appreciate your time. Thank I just you. want Thank to say I appreciate much. all the work you've done on it already. And, you know, you've made a list of those costs. Uh, I think we were prepared to cover those costs uh, as part of the grant. Awesome. So the registration fee, I noticed, we would, we, if there is a process that we can pay that registration fee directly, I think the board, I, I would think the board would support that given the conversations we've had earlier. Yep. So we would, the district would pay that registration fee for the students that are enrolled in the program. 
Excellent. We would also like to sit like we've been in contact with uh, Joe, Joe Mahoney, who's mm -hmm. through uh, yep. a retired police officer, so and so. He, he's kind of been our liaison a little bit with the NASA club, and we're going to sit down with them as well. They've offered a bunch of things, uh, and we're not going to say no to a lot of things, <laughs> you know. So, um, anything, you know, we do we need guns? You know, which is always an interesting purchase if you're looking at it. Uh, a lot of people have their, you know, a lot of people willing to, you know, have their own or, or have they'll offer one up. But I think at the end of the day, that's a discussion we will have with NASA, and they've they've been open about possibly purchasing them. And like I said, they've been very helpful. We'll, okay. we'll find out. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Pete. Thank, Thank you, you, Laura. All right, Pete. Appreciate all your work on this. Thank you. I mean, oh, that too. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> You already have that. I was thinking that we would bring, well, you've approved the expense of it. I was thinking we would bring a resolution formally approving it at the next meeting. Sounds good. All right, sounds good. Yep. Thank you. All right. Next presentation. Okay. We have invited Lisa Mahar to come uh, to present um, the district's implementation of the new. Uh, universal screener renaissance star and how we are utilizing that information to provide uh, early intervention and academic intervention services to our students i'm going to ask mr McHugh to give a general uh overview and then turn it over to lisa i'm going to actually work a little backwards so okay. um, renaissance star assessments it's been on our radar for several years uh, and really what we were looking for is an efficient way to screen all of our students. Uh, we started off K-5 this year. Uh, a couple of things that uh, I just wanna point out is that the plan um, really helped lend itself towards success. So, um, you know, we've been talking about it. We did our research. Our principals participated in training starting in this summer. Uh, they were ahead of it. Uh, when their faculty and staff came back uh, in September and having Lisa Mahar Tosa uh, was really the most critical uh, part of it being successful. But these are our Renaissance star assessments and this was a universal screener, uh, early literacy and reading. Um, and we looked at the below the 25 percentile and then those students qualified for tier two and or tier three intervention. And just a quick reminder, Tier two intervention is a small group intervention. It's usually two to five students, a tier three intervention. Uh, the intensity of that service, so maybe the duration is a little longer. A lot of times a tier three intervention could be one to one with a service provider and one student. Um, 852 is the magic number. So in our kindergarten, our first grade, our second grade, we may have uh, given those students the early literacy. If the student scored 852 or above, we gave them the actual reading universal screener. But this is where our, our numbers, when you look at our numbers, kindergarten, grade one, grade two, grade three, these are the number of students in each of the buildings that qualified for tier two or tier three intervention. So, you know, you go, you go right down the list, each of the buildings, you know how many students qualify. Uh, then we take a look at uh, Renaissance Star Math, grades one through three. We did not use Renaissance Star Math with our kindergartners uh, based on some recommendations, and Lisa Mahar will talk about that a little bit. But these are our number of students that qualified for tier two or tier three intervention, additional academic support uh, in mathematics, grades one, two, and three. And then we know exactly how many students needed that additional support in each of the buildings. So take Belltop, for example, where you see the number 46, doesn't necessarily mean 46 students. It could be the same student that needed that additional academic support in both early literacy reading and mathematics. So there could be some students that fell into that category, but you know where the needs are. You know, you can see the number of students that qualify for that additional academic support we get up into the higher grades, grades four and five, here's the universal star reading assessment. Again, you know the number of students that qualify for tier two and tier three intervention by grade level, by building. And then for mathematics, the same thing, grade four and grade five. And then what's really important is that 
These are the number of students in grades of four or five that qualified for additional academic support. You know where the needs are. And then we take a look at all of our students K-5 and we know how many students need that additional academic support. So 81 students at Belltop, 120 at Donald P. Sutherland and so on. One of the things that really needs to be taken into consideration is the dynamics of each of the uh, elementary buildings. So let's just take Green Meadow. Green Meadow has three self-contained classrooms. And I believe, I think Mr. Gary is here, but I believe you have 68 students with an individual education plan. So that plays into that too. When you see those numbers, you got to take into the other factors. So that's the power of the data. You can really dig into the data. You can ask questions and dig a little deeper. So some of our buildings are unique in structure and design. There's some specialized classrooms in some of the buildings, but that definitely impacts those numbers. But now you take a look at it, what we had prior, we had the number of uh, AIS providers in each building. So Belltop Elementary School had two. Uh, Donald P. Sutherland had 3.1 teachers. Uh, Janae, four. Uh, Green Meadow, three. And I believe Red Mill is three, correct? Uh, however, there is one position that's currently posted um, that is unfilled. So when we look at uh, the number of early intervention specialists that we assigned, we did not just, you know, randomly put two of our early intervention specialists in each of the buildings. We looked at the average student caseload by provider, and we tried to make that more equitable. Uh, you currently see Red Mill, uh, it's 29.3 once they're uh, fully staffed, but because they are one reading teacher short right now, their average caseload is 35 students per um, provider. So. Um, that's how we decided how we were going to utilize those early intervention specialists. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Lisa, but are there any questions? I, the point that I really want to make clear is that the student need drove our staffing, and that's different. Um, you know, in previous years, we, you know, Bell Tops always had two point. Oh, AIS teachers, really this is driven by need. We use those early intervention specialists really based on need. And the other thing to point out is for the first time in a long time, we're providing additional academic support, K-5 in the area of mathematics. That hasn't been done since probably in the 1990s. Um, so two, two big takeaways. Lisa? Yeah, the lower the better. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you know, it depends who you're talking to. No, it it is. You know, you really have the principals have done such a great job trying to figure out. You know, once they had their providers assigned, they had to find space, and then they had to really develop a schedule into the building. So early intervention, K one, two, three. So they had to use their AIS teachers maybe a little differently, maybe. Uh, more heavily scheduled in grades four and five and use those early interventions down in those lower grades. So uh, it really, it is a developmental kind of thing. When you talk about our earliest, youngest learners, you know, small group is effective, but it's progress monitoring. So now we're providing that academic intervention service. We're providing that early intervention support. And now we're progress monitoring to see what we're doing. Is it working? And if it's not working, then we change the intervention. Maybe we change the frequency of the intervention. Maybe we change the duration of that intervention. So it's not that you're just rolling out staff. You're really uh, targeted intervention. That data, what Lisa will get into, it really digs right down to the learning standards that the kids are struggling with. And that's that targeted intervention. So when we talk about early intervention and AIS, we're talking about, in theory, a revolving door as compared to a, a life sentence in your K-12 journey. Mm -hmm. We want those kids catching back up and leaving us. There may be new students that when we do our mid-year benchmark that now need that additional support. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Lisa, and, and then at the end, if you have some questions, uh, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. McHugh. First of all, I just want to thank Mr. McHugh and Ms. Cannon for hiring me for this position. I am your district RTI coordinator, teacher on special assignment. I just want to say that I absolutely love this position. Not only 
I've been hearing great things and I've been doing great things, but I really love doing the things that I'm doing. I also want to just say thank you to all the building principals for welcoming me every day of the week. I'm in their buildings all week long and they just welcome me with open arms. The staff have been great and it's just been a really just wonderful opportunity. So I'll try to keep this brief, but I think it's really important that the board knows what is happening with our universal screener. Mr. McHugh has invested in this new initiative and I want to let you know how amazing it is. So Renaissance Star Assessments. So how do we start a new initiative? We give us some great training, lots of training, front load us. He started out with the administrators. Then he went into the, we did in the beginning in the opening days, we went right with the classroom teachers, gave them full day professional development, special ed teachers, school psychologists, interventionists. Everybody came to those trainings. Then we had further training. We got champions, which I love this new name we have. The champions are those expert trainers. So we have experts. We have people that can troubleshoot. We have people that can send the positive message about Renaissance out there. So train, train, train. Three times a year, we're going to be giving this assessment. It's our new universal screener. What does that mean? That we now have a yearly, an annual reading and math skill growth measure that we can now target and we can see growth from year to year. And it's all right in the reports, which you guys are going to love seeing. <laughs> this universal screener provides that consistent, reliable, and valid data that we need to really target our interventions. I am reading off a little bit, just a little. I just need this. I'm not a full expert yet in Renaissance, but I think but we give me another month and I'll be able to actually work for Renaissance. <laughs> no, so, you won't. no, you won't. No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to negotiate that. <laughs> so I wanted to just put this slide out before I even told you anything about Renaissance. I just want you to know that we had major success. The full implementation, we prepared well. We had all the stakeholders involved. It was a collective effort. Mr. Goodwin ordered the headphones, K2. All children had headphones. We had Chromebooks. We had Chrome tablets. Everybody needed what they needed to take these assessments. We created building block schedules for test administration. We had the champions hands-on in the classrooms, supporting the classroom teachers, ministering these tests. And then those champions were able to quickly do turnarounds looking at data Data was coming to us within five to 10 minutes after taking the test. That's how quickly we could see, hey, did this student take that test too quickly? Oh, were they having a good day? Were they having a bad day? Or maybe we needed to pause the test. How do we do that? So these champions, the K3 interventionists and the K5 AIS providers have been amazing. Success all the way around. So. What are the STAR Renaissance assessments, right? You're probably all wondering that. That's what I'm wondering too. But let's get to that. So I want to just tell you that they're digital, okay? They're what we call computer adaptive tests. So let's go through that, right? Computer, that means they're all on the computer. So they could take them on a Chromebook or a Chrome tablet, which is what we use. They're adaptive. What does that mean? <clears throat> Well, that means that every student is going to get a test that's going to be unique to that student. The test items are going to adapt based on their ability and their accuracy. So just remember that when I go over some of the scoring. They're timed. There's a limited amount of tasks. It's normed nationally. So these are reliable measures that we're getting here. The data points are reliable. They're valid. And they measure students' performance in early literacy, in reading, and in math. We now have a math universal screener. Hooray. Okay. So star math, let me just quickly show you. Here's a couple quick examples. Star math, we administered in first grade through fifth grade. It is normed starting in first grade. We made the choice not to administer in kindergarten because they do not have normed assessments and normed data for, for, for kindergarten. So just a couple quick pictures. They have a next button. 
clear, easy to look at, not too confusing. I will tell you, see where it says not given? That was a little confusing for the children. So we did have to, again, we had the champions there. What is not given? What is this? You know, it's usually, what do we, the first graders don't even know what not given means. So we did have to clarify that. And it can be used with a mouse, touch pads, track pads. So it's really star math, first grade through fifth grade. Star early literacy. We gave kindergarten through second grade. What I liked about star early literacy is the test was read to them. The questions were about one to two minutes long. It takes about 10 minutes. It's quick. It's really quick. I mean, it's a one quick hit. You get an amazing result. We can do this at least three times a year. We can even use this if we want more often at AMP weeks during our progress monitoring. So some of the skills that you're going to see measured, you're only going to see a couple. They do not allow you to take, I could take pictures of the test. I should have done that, but <laughs> they probably wouldn't have liked that. Here's a couple quick questions. This was a categorization one. Some of the foundational skills you'll see that are being measured here are print concepts, phonemic awareness, phonics and word recognition, fluency, and sentence level comprehension. And then we have the star reading. That was given grades three through five. Mr. McHugh did tell you about that 852, and some of those younger students in K2 did take the star reading if they hit that benchmark 852. But it wasn't all, it wasn't 852 was a magic number. We really looked at the student. We said, okay, what was their FMP from last year? Are they a reader? What was some of their end of the year data? Are they really showing that they're a reader and they're ready for these, this next assessment? This assessment is significantly different. This is for a student that can read, okay? They are being tested on vocabulary acquisition. There's a question that what it might look like. Of course, this one's very simple. And the practice questions that they give, Kenneth Dukes, by the way, is, not, is a demo person. He is not a real person in our district. So just so you know that, this is a that was a demo name. I'm wondering where they got that name from. It's a famous person. <laughs> but anyway, so the questions in the practice set are so intentionally very simple, but a vocabulary question. Then you'll have short passages with a question such as maybe theme, or maybe they'll ask an inference question, or maybe it will be a text structure, where they might say it's, it's asking for cause and effect, or maybe it will be an author craft, like point of view or use of language. So that's what the test looks like. There is a little timer up there that did stress out some of our little our students. And we have to just emphasize with them that even though it's timed, it's okay, you'll be fine. You just, I think we had to make this so that, you know, hey, we're just gonna try this out this time. And I think it will be fine the next time around for those kiddos. If we can put a maybe sticky note on the timer. <laughs> Okay, so quickly, I just want to go through, what are the three most important scores that we're getting here? We're getting a benchmark score. And this is wonderful because who likes colors, right? I mean, let's face it, we all do. And numbers are great, but if you're not statistical and you're not mathematical, numbers sometimes can be tricky. That's why I like Renaissance. They give you a number and, or a color and they say, Red is those urgent interventions. Those are those kiddos that are below that 10 percentile rank. They're the ones that need intervention. Mr. McHugh talked about tier two and tier three interventions. Small group, targeted instruction. We get those results in five to 10 minutes. That's why we started groups within two weeks of the school year. It's amazing the results and how quickly it can happen. Yellow are your intervention. They are the below the 25th percentile. And then as you can see, blue goes to on watch and then we have green. So let me just quickly go and tell you our next. The next one that's important, is it because I'm, right? So percentile rank, PR and SS, scaled score. Those are scores that are on every report for teachers. And they're great to look at when it comes just a quick explaining to parents, explaining to another teacher, explaining, talking amongst each other. What was his percentile right? What was hers? What was their scaled score? 
Percentile rank is that quick normed reference score that a child gets. It measures their student's reading and math ability. It is compared to all students in the same grade nationally. Okay, I love the percentile rank. Anyone been to the doctors with their child lately? They give you the, right, the percentile rank, the growth score. They say, okay, Johnny, come up and get measured your height and your weight. And then you hear their 40th percentile and you're cheering, right? We all think 40 sounds low. It's really not, actually. But when your child's get in the 40th percentile rank, you're thinking, yes, it's not out of, it's not a percent. It's a percentile rank. It's a growth score. So that's a great metaphor I've been using with teachers. <laughs> and then scaled score is a little bit different. They're compared with each other. The scaled score is the more difficult the item, the test item, the more they get accurate. And if that keeps going up, 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 the score goes up, up, up. Scaled score goes down, down, down. If the level of difficulty goes down, accuracy goes down. Very important. Those are two, they're on every report. I'm gonna show you the reports quickly. Here's a report that I love. It's called Star Record Book. This is a grade five one. There it is. Look at, you've got the colors. I was able to organize them. I can, an interventionist can look at this report and say, oh, we've got two students that need urgent intervention. We've got three that need intervention. Tier two and tier three group right there. There's reports that show us what focus skills we need to work on. What readiness level are they at? These reports are quick and easy to read. Okay. Next, another quick report, star screener report. You know why I like this one? Again, who likes pictures? There's a nice bar graph. Don't we all like to, and there, look at that white line. That's that proficiency benchmark. So that 40th percentile rank, rate matched up with the scaled score. Wow. And you know what I love about this, uh, the screening report? Down below, it gives me a whole picture of my class. Wow, look at that. That's how many students are at or above benchmark for me. It says 70, I'm having a hard time reading it from here. Does it say 78th percent? I can't, sorry. And then there's 30, I can't read it from here, I'm sorry. Okay, but that gives us a quick, quick glance at our, of our class. It's just, it's a really great, Report. Another great one really quickly, let's say I have one student that I want to bring to data teams or IST, or I'm concerned. I want to bring it to the principal. I want to bring the school, school psychologist. I need data. Here it is. Again, you see a lot of the same things. You see the percentile rank. You see the scaled score. This one's great because it tells you how long it took them to take the test. Notice it says domain scores. Now we've got even more information. Now we've got the actual domains. Those are those categories of those topics, those skills. Where is the child at from zero to 100? What is their mastery level in the grade level with that specific skill? It provides you with a number. Let's say it's 50%. What that means is a child is able to get 50% correct out of 100 on a test. So yes, it's a little bit different, that domain score. OK. And the last one I just wanted to quickly show you was instructional planning. These are great reports, again, for our interventionists. You know, not just the interventionists. This is now going to be excellent, great information for our tier one, our classroom teachers. We're not only pulling them out and giving them a dip of intervention, but in the classroom, they can get differentiated instruction. We've got focus skills right there. We know we can target specific students, specific groups of students. There's so much data here. It's just, it's, it's beyond unbelievable. And if, you know what else I like about this one? It gives you a literacy classification, which is great because if you're, you're struggling to try to explain where are they on the range of reading, it gives you a great definition. Where are they? They're an emerging reader. What does that mean? Renaissance gives you a great definition of what that means. Great resource for teachers. So, well, guess what? More success, everyone. We had data teams, abbreviated versions. We had our interventionists work collaboratively with school psychologists, principals, and we 
looked at those beautiful reports with colors, we looked at the data, we looked at the instructional planning, and we got our groups. I'm going to tell you this was no easy feat. They did it in two weeks time. They created new schedules. They had 10, eight new interventionists, soon to be 10, that they had to put into those schedules. We have a new screener. So they were all a little bit panicked in a good way. Change is good. They were excited, but they're nervous. They've got eight new friends in that they have to work with and they have to now put math in. It's not only four, five, or three, four, five, it's first and second now. These were a lot of big changes and our teachers did it in two, two and a half weeks time. We had intervention groups going, success. And we're just about done. I just wanted to show you a couple pictures. We have an intervention. This is one of our interventionists, Kara Sullivan at Janae. She is providing a math group. Look at those nice dividers there. She's actually using math manipulatives that Mr. McHugh got from our envisions. She's using a base 10 multi-sensory approach with some of those um, students that are probably in that, that needing some of the intervention with those foundational skills. Those are just some of the um, resources that they've been using and, and approaches they use. And then we have a reading group here. This is Lisa Rust, and she's up at DPS. She has a book there, and she's doing what's called a book walk. We have LLI books, so she had the students there, and they, were, they had the books in hand. I love that. Uh, we have a really great reading program. Our, we've been, I've been doing some training on the side with some of these interventionists. So we've got phonemic awareness instruction. We've got a book study going. We have a lot of great resources out there that these interventionists and our AIS pro providers are excited to get to know and learn more about. And this is it. Looking ahead, we're going to be doing some CBM trainings, curriculum-based measures. If you have ever heard of the Dibbles, we just want to have another measure, another tool that we can use. So when we have Renaissance Star and we see a, a student scores an urgent intervention, we want to have multiple pathways and say, okay, here they, they scored this on Renaissance, what's next? We need to have multiple measures, we know that, but we needed to get Renaissance, we needed to get it off properly. We needed to start out and get a baseline at the beginning of the year. We did it, we're doing great. This is what's next. We're gonna administer those CBMs after we get trained. We'll refine those intervention groups like Mr. McHugh said. We'll get those groups fluid in and out. Hopefully we'll get students in and out because now we have focused skills that we know from our instructional planning report that we'll be working on. So hopefully we'll see some growth and report, um, progress within six to eight weeks. And that's it. I just wanted to quickly show you a couple of the reports that we can pull up. This is the whole district. Look at that. You can just quickly at a glance, at a glance you don't even need to look and say, look at how many students, and this one is early literacy, how many students are at or above benchmark. And then we have reading, that one, star reading, that one's, that one's, you know, just looking at, but just now that you've seen those math, if I go back for a second to early literacy, Mr. McHugh has interventionists at K3, early literacy, K2. You see where the need is? That shows it right there. Thank you, everyone. So if the board members have any questions um, of Lisa or Mr. McHugh, Lisa is doing a fabulous job supporting this implementation. And I was only kidding. You can work for Renaissance uh, maybe 10 years from now after you retire. After retirement. <laughs> Do you have any final clo uh, closing comments at all? No. Okay. Appreciate everybody's support. Yep. Fun, fun, very smooth. I think in the in the situation we had in the last year regarding the pandemic and and the issues of learning loss and other gaps, I think this is a great tool and a great re uh, investment in our district, in our our staff, to help our parents, to help our students, 
and really kind of bridge those gaps and see where we have to focus our efforts on because we we, we made that uh, using those resources we had from the federal government to um, add those positions and i think it'll really pay off as we can see that we have the data to support the things we the activities we have to make and i appreciate the efforts lisa um with the team and and the principal support teacher support to uh, to help our students as they as they overcome these difficulties and challenges so um i'd be really curious to see in the next assessment around how kind of progress we're making i'm really looking forward to maybe doing another report back in the um the next uh post assessment which is like what january uh, mid -mid of the year. Sorry. yeah the next the next round was yeah, there we go great thank you board members any other comments or questions Excellent. All right, that completes our reports and presentations. Uh, we'll move to discussion items, the 20, 20, 2021, or that's supposed to be 2022, 2023 items, and typo there. So who wants to take us through that? So this is the calendar. Linda, you wanna kind of take us through a little bit here and any questions for the board? Another tough act to follow. Uh, <laughs> so. So this is the 2022-2023 budget calendar. Um, we will, this calendar, the, the important date is May 17th. That is our vote date, May 17th, 2022. And all of these other dates back up from that date. So we will be issuing the budget handbooks to our budget builders, our, print boarding, our building principals and department supervisors. Uh, at the end of November and the beginning of December, we will meet with the board in mid-December to talk about our priorities of um, the administration and the board. And then we have a series of workshops beginning with March 9th and March 23rd. And then we will look to adopt the, bud the budget on March, on April 13th. And we will have our budget hearing and presentation on May 4th. Uh, after that presentation, the budget newsletter will be distributed. Uh, in the meantime, there will be four publications in the newspaper, and uh, those will include not only the budget, uh, but also the propositions for the bus purchase and if the board wants to establish a capital reserve. Those will be included as well. Are there any questions on the calendar? Linda, how does the, the workshops line up with the board meetings? Do you recall? With the board meetings? Yes. They are on board meetings. Okay, nights. so yes. does that work for people? I mean, that's, you know, I, I think sometimes um, we may want to look at that again because there's some really uh, detailed information that we want to get into. We may want to be flexible in terms of having a separate in between. Yes, in workshop. the past we've had. Yeah, uh, especially in the month of March, we've yeah. had board meetings, and then on the off weeks, we do the budget workshop. So that will be um, up to the board as yeah. to whether you want to yeah, do it I think during the board um, meeting or in a separate meeting. Yeah, I, I'd like to be a little bit flexible around that. I know I don't want to have people have more meetings. That's not my my goal. It's really about having the conversations, uh, the detailed uh, information. I mean, of course. You know, everything hinges on what the state's going to do in terms of state aid a lot of times and getting that information. I just want to have, make sure we have good conversations about our needs, um, what's impacting the district, some of the resources that we have available that we can use, and um, make sure we have uh, real thoughtful conversations uh, regarding the budget. You know, last year was uh, excellent, you know, 0% zero zero tax levy. I think, you know, in these times, I think that's always the goal for me to be as close as that as possible um, and make sure we still have the resources though to meet the needs of our students and families. So just wanna be open for that. That's my only comment about that, that period of time in the budget review and those workshops. We will look to uh, have this calendar approved at the next board meeting on 11-3. So I can just add a statement to this that the dates will remain flexible dependent on the need. Is everybody okay with that? Workshops. In case we need to have conversations, I mean, maybe set up an additional meeting or, or something like that for a workshop, just so if there is something that's uh, a big topic that comes, you know, it's it's still early, that's that's next year, next March. Um, I just wanna be able to have that time and not have to rush through a, a workshop and a board meeting at the same time. Okay. So you would have the 14th, for example, if, if we wanted to have the flexibility to do that, I think it's a good idea, we would, 
we would we could either put a statement in there or we could just reserve the 14th between March 9th and March 23rd as a tentative uh, discussion session on the budget and not have anything else on the agenda. Okay. That would be. Do we want to keep those meetings on Wednesdays, Wednesday evenings? Yeah, that's fine. Does that work? Wednesdays okay, Wednesday. so it would be like the, the 16th, March 16th, if we Actually, make it the Wednesday. The 14th, 16th, excuse me. No, yeah, whatever that Wednesday is. And if we don't need it, we, we don't, we'll just not do it. Just to reserve that data. That yeah, that's okay. That's a possibility. Yep, thank you. Yep. Any other uh, comments or questions on the calendar? It's pretty straightforward. Okay. Next item, um, as you know, and we've talked about earlier, uh, Deanna uh, was no longer living in the district and had to resign from her seat. Um, that resignation is on the regular business agenda. Thoughts about filling the vacancy? Um, in the past, we've had uh, put a story out uh, in the web about soliciting interest in filling the remainder of the term. Do you want to go with that same process and then solicit input? And then we'll have people um, send in information in, and then we can uh, do interviews like we have in the past. And that, that candidate would fulfill that term, and then most likely would be running in the in the, uh, the for next year. Okay. Yes, Mark. Yes. Yes, yeah. we'll do that. Yeah, whatever we can publicize to get the, the word out. Okay. All right. So um Mark Adam just did send me a a, a preview draft of a, what we did last time. We'll follow the same process and then we'll just have to be flexible in terms of the board members getting together and being able to do uh uh, a review and interviews with those candidates that come forward. Uh, last time we, I think we had Frank, you were by Zoom, I believe that was a Zoom uh, interview process, right? So, well, uh, whatever the interest is for the board doing uh, Zoom or in person, uh, I'll, I'll be flexible, but we'll, let's see what we get in terms of candidates' uh, interest and then we'll go from there, okay? And the next topic is commencement of e-cigarettes and vaping litigation. Some background, Mr. Simons? Uh, yes, over the summer, our law firm, uh, the Farrar Friends of Law Firm, contacted us and asked us if our board would be interested in joining a uh, mass litigation suit against Juul Incorporated uh, related to Juul's marketing of uh, vaping uh, and e-cigarettes towards children. Um, at the time, we had a discussion of it. Uh, what this would involve is our board joining other boards of education in uh, both our state and other states uh, in litigation. And um, that cost of that litigation is funded through uh, a portion of whatever settlement is uh, awarded or negotiated. The um, uh, attorneys, I talked to the attorneys today because I know there were some board members that had some questions. Uh, it, they, they estimate that the the fees of the firm representing the suit would be approximately 20 percent of whatever settlement occurs uh, our board would incur no expenses towards the Ferrar firm or directly with the firm that is representing uh, all of the districts um, the the um, in other states where these types of suits have been brought um, there have been settlements and those settlements are typically based on uh, uh, issues that districts are experiencing with students vaping uh, for either uh, offsetting current expenses or future expenses. And one of the things I sought to clarify with the Ferrar firm today was uh, if there were questions or concerns regarding whether we needed to demonstrate specifically that we have been impacted from a cost standpoint by vaping. Uh, and they said no. Uh, in fact, that in some states, uh, states have uh, tried to tackle vaping with students by mandating certain unfunded mandates, such as the detection systems that we've been talking about uh, in the safety committee. So. The board could uh, use a portion of the award for any future expenses that you might incur to tackle the problem of student vaping. One of the things I thought about over the last week was 
we do employ a prevention specialist on contract with Rensselaer County, uh, Alyssa Evans, and uh, a lot of her work is preventative and intervention related to student uh, student vaping, student use of uh, other types of uh, you know drugs and harmful products. So um, this is an issue that we experience. Uh, we do have um, a program intended to both prevent and also refer. Uh, we've had uh, concerns, typically at the high school level, about uh, vaping in the restrooms. We've talked about it at our safety committee, but uh, it's it's at the at the prerogative of the board as to whether the board wants to join this suit. Uh, we wanted to have a discussion of it tonight. Uh, there is a timeline by which we would need to join the suit. I also asked the Ferrar firm to provide me information regarding other districts in New York State that are part of this, and they're going to get me that information between now and the next meeting. And um, one of the other issues we talked about is once the board approves this, there'll be a survey that we have to do. It's a general survey that for each of the uh, districts that join the suit, uh, some demographic information, some enrollment information, but also what are some of the uh, issues that we might uh, be experiencing with students related to vaping. And I, I know that the county, through Alyssa's work, tracks that data for us. Thoughts on um, being participants in this? Anybody? No comments? Okay. Okay. Any other thoughts? Not interest, not really interested. In don't see value in it, I can't, I'm, I'm kind of indifferent. I mean, I do know that the, for me, the health effects and the impact on, on students with e-cigarettes and vaping is tremendous. It's a problem. If, if this is the right way to do it, you know, I, I, I think, you know, education, you know, and the dangers using our resources that we have for other kinds of things that impact health uh, is a more appropriate venue i think for me so again i think i'd be listening willing to listen to the information but i don't know how how much interest i know john dunn specifically texted me and said that he's not doesn't support this effort so um we can get the information mr simons sure. and we'll talk about it and see if we want to put something on the agenda to formalize it but i think we're pretty consistent from last time that we really wasn't a lot of interest in this You're good okay yeah. thank, thank you, you. All right, moving on to regular business. The first item is approval of programs for resident children with disabilities. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, I need a motion to approve that. Kathleen, second Joanne, all those in favor? Approve. So we have uh, four resolutions for tenure. Um, very glad to see this. Uh, the first one is for Noel Demolowitz. Any questions or comments? Need a motion to approve that. Michelle, I need a second. Kathleen, all those in favor? Approved. Congratulations, Noel. Next one we have is for Stephanie Prolazo. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, I need a motion to approve that. Joanne, I need a second. Michelle, all those in favor? Congratulations to Stephanie. Next one I see is for a, a familiar face here in the building. I think Mr. Harkin. I think I see him hiding behind the computers. How are you, Mr. Harkin? Yeah. Any questions or comments? Need a motion to approve that? Mark, second. Frank, all those in favor? Approved. Congratulations, Mr. Harkin. <laughs> Officially December 29, 2021. And our final tenure recommendation is for 
Uh, Susan Pagonis, I'm saying that right, Melissa? Okay. Uh, any questions or comments on that? Need a motion to approve that? Kathleen, I need a second. Mark, those in favor? Approved. Congratulations, Susan. I want to congratulate our, our uh, those who um, received tenure this evening, and we'll see them in, in June. So again, just a round of applause for those folks. Congratulations again. And uh, we have our tenure recognition later in the, in the school year. Next item is the 2020-2021 uh, audit report and financial statements. We had the presentation earlier. Any questions or comments for Linda? Finally? Need a motion to approve that. Michelle, I need a second. Cheryl, all those in favor? Approved. Window replacement bid project. Any background, Mr. Simon, you want to provide? But that's not in the, the memo? Or yes, we previously shared with the board um, that our uh, previous bids came in favorably and that we were uh, interested in completing all of the window replacements at Janae. And we had enough uh, money uh, based on these bids to uh, also include the uh, the uh, the uh, DPS windows and uh, associated painting of the lentils. So um, we're recommending that we award the base bid as well as the alternates. Is that correct, Linda? That's correct. And we did receive nine uh, bids. Um, the, the lowest bidder was ViewTech, and we had to disqualify that because some of the information was incorrect and missing. So this bid um, is being recommended to be awarded to Murnane General Contractors. Very good. Um, any questions or comments on the bid? Don't see any, so we'll need a motion to approve the bid. Frank, second. Kathleen, all those in favor? Approved. And final part of our regular business, uh, with regret, resignation of board member Deanna Youth. Need a motion to accept that. Mark, second, Michelle. All those in favor? Okay, that resignation is accepted and we talked earlier about the process we're gonna use. I just wanna thank Deanna for her support and being part of the board and wish her well in her new, uh, in her home and um, thank her for everything she's done for the district. Okay. No other regular business, we'll move on to committee reports. Uh, move on to Marissa Cannon. Thank you, Mr. Pino. I wanted to provide a staffing update tonight. Um, we have made a lot of ground in filling our um, teaching assistant positions. Um, so I'm happy to report tonight that we only have two full-time teaching assistant positions left to fill. One is um, in our CTAP program and the other is at Goff Middle School. We have two part-time positions at Goff. And then we have one part-time position at Columbia High School. Um, on tonight's consent agenda, we have um, a gentleman who is resigning from that part-time position to accept a full-time position within the district. Our school safety supervisor um, position, which is um, going to be 3.5 hours in the evening, Tim Malloy um, is conducting interviews this week. Um, for the senior typist position in our guidance department at Columbia High School, initial building level interviews were conducted last week, and Mr. Harkin and I are doing final round interviews on Friday. Um, for our senior custodian um, position, um, which was to replace Mr. Kevin Kelly in retirement, um, those building level um, interviews have commenced, and Paul Bickle and I will be holding the final rounds also on Friday. We have two mechanic positions open in our bus garage. Um, this is now the third time we've posted. Um, we are currently not successful at recruiting um, mechanics, but we did just take out an ad in our Times Union uh, local paper on Sunday. So we're hoping that will generate some interest and we'll have some mechanic applicants. We have a cook position at our high school. We have a food service helper position at Red Mill. And um, we have a Spanish position at our middle school, which we um, are still recruiting for. Um, we've now posted three times. Mr. McHugh, myself, and Jill Barker are meeting on Tuesday of next week to discuss um, possible solutions um, and reaching out to Questar as well. 
We have um, our nurse, uh, Betsy Cahoon, who is retiring at the end of this month. I'm very pleased to report that um, we did select a nurse to fill that role, and she'll be starting on November 1st, and that recommendation for appointment is on tonight's consent agenda. We have um, a testing coordinator position that closed today. As of um, when I left the office, there were no candidates, but I will uh, check on that tomorrow morning. If we need to, we will repost. And our temporary 12-month nurse position closed. Um, we had no candidates. We did have one person interested, um, and they have um, withdrawn their candidacy for that role due to a personal reason. And um, data entry machine operator, which is in Peter Goodwin's office. We do have candidates for that role. Mr. Goodwin is going to be reviewing those candidates and conducting initial interviews. And we have our wellness coordinator, which is going to be a district-wide position under um, Mr. Leonard's um, supervision. Those initial interviews were conducted today. We had eight candidates apply, um, and four um, were asked to come in and interview. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions? No. Uh, the testing coordinator, that was an RN level position, right? Do you think that's one of the reasons why you're not getting anything? Or is it, I mean, the testing, something's going to bring up later mm -hmm. about the testing, surveillance testing itself, but the, it, does it have to be a nurse? I know we wanted it to be a nurse. It actually does not have to be a nurse. So that's something that we might want to reevaluate. Yeah. And I will talk to Mr. Simons about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Yeah. Moving on to Linda. Anything? None at this time. Anything? Okay. And Jim? Our education committee met on August 4th. Uh, the topic that was discussed was elementary recess. We had a uh, few parents that voiced a concern regarding students not having enough time to eat and enough time to socialize and play. Uh, on October 4th, we reviewed the elementary school student day. It is 6.5 hours, 390 minutes. We discuss the instructional requirements that come out of NYSID. Um, you know, ELA, 90 minute uh, uninterrupted block daily, mathematics, 60 minutes. We cover our next generation science or social studies, which also has required minutes, uh, along with technology, career development, occupational studies, health, uh, and the morning AM arrival logistics, the PM dismissal logistics, transitional time for our students, uh, our specials that are required. Um, and we also, part that we talked about is we have the universal screener and our students that need that additional academic support, that has to happen in addition to outside of that 90 minute ELA block, in addition to outside that 60 minute mathematics block. So. It's a challenge. We didn't shut the door on it. Uh, our principals are talking about um, how they run the recess in their buildings. They're trying to expand that a little bit. Our teachers give movement breaks throughout the day. Uh, some of our teachers pick their class up uh, at recess and then take them to another part of that outside playground area to extend the recess. Um, you know, we don't want to have too many students on the playground in at the same time uh, with limited supervision. So there's a lot of logistics. We also talked about outside opportunities that exist for our students in the East Greenbrier School community. But we are re we are reviewing our current K-5 recess practices. We are surveying our uh, neighboring districts and looking to see what other districts do for recess. And uh, we will share that information out and get back uh, to those parents. Uh, we also had our Committee for Curriculum Study on October 6th. Uh, that is a very enjoyable meeting each October. Our curriculum writers that uh, participated in projects over the summer present their work. Uh, it is listed in the minutes. I won't get into it uh, by each project, but in brief, the Algebra 1, we had to do some work to adjust uh, our curriculum to align with the next generation learning standards. We're ahead of the game. For Algebra 1, we're ready to go, and that requirement hasn't uh, come into effect yet. Advanced Placement, English Language, and Composition, uh, we revised that curriculum. You'll see some new text on the November 3rd agenda uh, for that class, some new novels, some reading. Our Next Generation Science Standards 
again, in the high school physics living environment, earth science chemistry, it's that continued transition to next generation science standards. You see some work in academic skills, developing soft skills for our life skills class. That's in response to the program review that was completed last year. Uh, CTAP, English 9 and 10, that was a project that needed to be completed because of the low enrollment in CTAP. And it's low enrollment specifically because that's the way it's designed. But English 9 and English 10 need to be taught at the same time. So, uh, you know, that's a little tricky, making sure that you're covering the ninth grade and the 10th grade curriculum. Um, again, the goal to develop common math assessments, you see that in there. Again, the units of study uh, for next generation science standards, both at K-5 and 6-8, along with the high school. The K-5 social studies, uh, it's a great accomplishment. There are consistent units of studies with activities and assessments. Uh, K-5 has a consistent four units now, culture, economics, geography, and government. K-5 phys ed rewrote their curriculum. Um, I won't give you the date of the last rewrite of the K-5 curriculum, but it was prior to my arrival here in 1988. So uh, <laughs> um, the sixth grade digital literacy curriculum was written to integrate that into our uh, middle school tech uh, and some uh, ELA for the middle school as well. Uh, we talked a little bit about new course proposals and new textbook proposals to do November 12th. And then we reviewed professional development. There's been 88 professional development sessions either held or endorsed by the district so far this year. We have another half day of professional developments, the only one remaining that's coming up in March 25th. So we started that planning as well. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Moving on to uh, um, Mr. Simons. Uh, yes, just briefly, I wanted to elaborate a little bit on some of the comments I made regarding our Committee on Global Education in response to Mr. Jones's uh, questions at public comment. We did have our first meeting of the year on October 12th. Um, the committee reviewed the professional development that has been provided uh, already this year and the schedule of what will be provided during the year. We did have a professional development opportunity at Bell Top School today, which was attended by more than 30 staff. Additionally, we talked about how we might best utilize some of the resources that the State Education Department has publicized in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, there were some suggestions that we uh, make sure that the staff is familiar with those documents by having some facilitated discussions within our faculty meetings, department meetings, and grade level meetings. Additionally, we reviewed uh, some of the efforts that are going on in every school to make sure that families feel welcome and can orient uh, successfully to our school community. Uh, we're working on a, web, a portion of our website that would be dedicated to community resources. So if people need to know uh, options for uh, health services, options for other types of services in the community, they can go on our website and it'd be uh, like a one-stop shop. Um, additionally, there uh, is an interest in continuing some of the book studies that teachers have been leading throughout our, our district. And um, we also indicated that we would continue to review our policies and our procedures to ensure that they are inclusive as uh, much as they can be and in accordance with some of the resources that have been provided by by the state. Uh, so that's, uh, the committee is very, very uh, pleased with the progress we're making, very enthusiastic about the work we're doing, and we, uh, we look forward to continuing to meet as a committee to uh, make sure that we are, are uh, paying uh, adequate attention to diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and doing it in a way that uh, brings everybody together. Any questions, Mr. Simons? I just got to log back into my board docs. I'm sorry, I got kicked out of my agenda. Okay, there we go. All right, that concludes our committee reports, table motions, uh, board members. I don't have any here at this time. Any uh, old business board members that come forward? Um, one thing I do have um, in the September 29th meeting, there was a resolution passed by the board regarding the uh, vaccine and high, high risk sports. The first deadline was 10 15. So if we can have an update the next meeting, kind of where things are with sure. high risk sports, I'd appreciate that. We've started yeah. compiling some of the data that has been submitted through. Um, 
through a family ID. Okay. Uh, and we're cross-referencing it with some of the data that we already have that our nurses have regarding the vaccination status of students. Okay. And, and any updates that we can get from any other school districts that may have in, in the in intervening time have uh, yeah. also gone this route? I, I know that Schenectady's board passed a resolution since the last time okay. we discussed this. So there are seven school districts in the Suburban Council that have the same requirement. Okay. And all of the districts in uh, Columbia County have the same requirement okay. currently. And I know North County was taking it up as a discussion item. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Can we also include any, uh, not names, but any requests for exemptions? At this point, I received no formal requests for exemptions, no forms. Okay. So five parents have contacted me regarding the issue since we passed the resolution. Okay. Was there an email about asking about an exemption? No, no one has submitted the exemption. Did we answer that email to that individual? Yes. Okay. All right, so we'll get some updated information at the next meeting. That'd be that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our old business, unless anybody else had anything. No. Moving on to consent agenda, any uh, questions or comments on the consent items, A through G? I want to recognize um, the agent. Of course, yes. Uh, we got a free large one from Target uh, for <clears throat> Very good. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no other comments or questions, uh, I need a motion to uh, approve those items by consent. Michelle, second. Kathleen, all those in favor? Approved. Addendums, we have no addendums this evening. Uh, new business, board members, any new business to bring forward? I did have one, a couple items. Um, one of the things that's coming out is the surveillance testing, and I know that uh, we've had some questions and how that process is going. Um, can you kind of give us a little update Jeff, yes. on kind of where we are with surveillance testing? There's a meeting scheduled tomorrow with Craig Hansen and all of the superintendents in Quest Arboses to review the surveillance testing proposal plan that Questar is putting in place. Um, we had a discussion of surveillance testing with Craig and the county DOH today. And uh, we were anticipating that the delivery of 35,000 tests was going to occur today at Questar. As of 3.30, I spoke to Craig and he did not, he was unaware as to whether or not the tests had been delivered and he was going to get back to me okay. um, if, that, if that had occurred. Um, the, Questar's recommendation is that the surveillance testing for employees begin first, that that be the first phase, and uh, that is a recommendation that he's going to make, I believe, tomorrow to all of the superintendents in the component districts um, uh, and get some feedback. Um, the district is currently in a good position to begin to collect information on the vaccination status of our employees through an electronic portal called Qualtrics, which we have uh, purchased through Questar, which we have done a test uh, of, a, of a submission to Marissa's office, and we, are, we will be in good shape to start that process uh, really by mid to end of next week. Uh, so we have a, a confidential manner in which uh, employees can submit their uh, proof of vaccination. That will give us a more accurate account than we currently have of the number of employees that would be required to be tested once per week. Um, the uh, consent forms were sent home to students, uh, I believe a week ago Friday. And as of this point and the date that the survey will close is October 25th. We've received 723 responses to the surveys. 
44% of those responses have indicated approval and consent for surveillance testing for students. Uh, that's 319 students total. I don't have the breakdown by level, but according to Mr. Adam, the, major, the, the larger portions of the consents are coming from the elementary school level. Um, we have 73% of our families who responded to the survey interested in the point of care testing which is the testing that we can do on symptomatic students. That's 530 students at this point. And again, that's based on 723 responses. So this data continues to come in on a daily basis. We're taking a look at it and we're providing the numbers to Craig so that he can um, anticipate what um, the testing is gonna look like. We, we are in discussions with uh, our bargaining units regarding testing. Uh, we under there has been a request by our bargaining units to have an MOA related to testing from the Teachers Association and SRP. Uh, we are we are in communication through our attorney uh, regarding that MOU, and the content of the MOU is not finalized as of yet. Uh, and um, some of the areas are a subject for executive session. Okay. Um, the, the Questar has hired staff to do the testing. Um, the schedule of that is going to be shared with us tomorrow at the meeting. Uh, today, uh, some of the staff has contacted our schools to schedule a visit to come over to become familiar with our school buildings to identify potential locations for the uh, testing to occur. Uh, but they will be coming in and they will be doing the surveillance testing. Um, so the plan as proposed by Questar right now is first phase would be to start with the employee testing. Obviously we would need our agreements with our employees to be in place prior to that uh, and we think we'll be able to do that. Then uh, phase in the student testing, remembering that the regulation requires us to offer testing. We have to have consent to unvaccinated students. Right now, based on concerns regarding the availability of future test kits, we may have to limit that um surveillance testing to only unvaccinated students we haven't made that final determination yet but that's a conversation i think craig is planning to have tomorrow as well then after the surveillance testing for the students is implemented once we have the machines uh which we don't yet we would do the point of care testing and we are going to start a discussion on thursday with our SRP union and some nurses about how that point of care testing will work in our district and what, uh, how the nurses see that as a potential impact on the work that they're already doing. So uh, we're, we're proceeding with the planning with Questar, uh, communicating what we know, and um, we expect that if everything goes according to our tentative timelines, the employee testing could be in place soon after November 1st, followed by the student testing sometime either late November or December, and then the point of care testing. Uh, and again, everything is subject to those test kits coming in. Yep, right. And um, the the conversations that we're having with our, with our bargaining units. Thank you. Any other questions regarding that? I know I wanted to bring it up because I know it's an important topic. It is something that's being driven through the regulatory process, through Department of Health. It's not something that we, you know, chose. Uh, this is something that has to be done. And it should it actually went into effect a while ago, which is that with the testing and the ELC funding for right. grants to, to provide the support, it was it was it was put on hold until that all came together. So I should we, want to comment on athletic testing for just a minute. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yep. We have been um, testing uh, high risk fall sports athletes once a week. Uh, our test uh, expired on the 13th of October. Uh, we don't have any tests that are uh, usable.
currently. Uh, we plan to uh, start scheduling that testing again once we have the tests. There's probably about three weeks left of the fall sports season, which takes under consideration uh, some of our teams advancing in the sectionals and um, uh, potentially advancing to the states. Uh, we have some teams that are doing really well. Uh, so we're being optimistic that, that the season may go all the way out to November 13th, around November 13th for some sports. Um, we're, again, based on availability of the kits, it, it is something that we did to be uh, mindful of CDC requirements. So my recommendation would be once we have the kits to resume that testing once a week for all high-risk okay. sports uh, kids. Okay. Uh, right now it's on pause because we don't have the kits. Okay. Okay. Any questions on that? No? All right. Thank you for the information. We look forward to more more to come as you uh, meet with the, the different groups and with the uh, safety folks. Next item is the uh, the public forum number two. Anybody want to uh, address the board? No? We'll now move to the uh, our second board forum. I'll start on my right with Cheryl, I think. Good. Frank? Good. Joanne? Kathleen, grab the microphone. Okay. I just want to comment on um, the choral group that we had here earlier. Sure, sure. I really didn't realize how much I had missed hearing <laughs> the kids getting together to sing, and it really was very, very nice. And thank you for arranging that. Yeah. And they were wonderful. They are <laughs> terrific. Yep, terrific. Thank you, Kathleen. Mark, you good? And Michelle, good. Um, just want to say thank you again for. Recognizing the board with our, our snacks. Uh, what's it say? Nacho Average Board. Nice little card here. So, Mr. Buono, Jean Pangburn put those baskets together. Oh, Jean, thank and, you. Uh, she's very talented in yes, several I areas. See that. But, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. With that, uh, no other board comments. Um, we do have need for executive session for purpose of contractual items and personnel matters. We don't anticipate any board business after the executive session. So thank you, everyone. I need a motion to move into executive session. Michelle, I need a second. Joanne, all those in favor? Approve. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Appreciate it.